It's, it's really such a pleasure for me to be here and uh, have the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about surgical ethics and the future of surgery, as you heard. What I do sort of most of the time is endocrine surgery. So endocrine surgery means I take out things like thyroids, parathyroids, and adrenal glands, sometimes islet cell tumors of the pancreas. And what is striking about that is as an endocrine surgeon, I actually don't fix anything. <laughs> All I can do is take it out. And so my kids have learned if they have a medical issue, they don't talk to me about it <laughs> because I have a very small repertoire. You know, your thyroid's not working, we take it out. Adrenal's not working, we take it out. We don't fix anything at all. But so this is in some ways, um, I would argue is, is different. The, the concept of surgical ethics is different from what I do, but also completely part of what I do. And I'll just try to explain that to you. Um, by way of introduction, I think it's valuable to know that um, there are a lot of stereotypes uh, in medicine, and you all probably are familiar with them. And one of the major ones is that, you know, the internist is the kindly, uh, you know, wonderful, caring individual like Marcus Welby, MD, right? So you're all way too young to even know who that is. <laughs> But nevertheless, this is sort of a stereotype of, you know, the, the, the wonderful internist who, you know, has cared for your family and your, your parents and your grandparents and you know, they're pillars of the community. Well, in contrast, there are stereotypes about surgeons, right? The stereotypes about surgeons are it doesn't really matter if he or she is a nice guy. All it matters is how they are in the operating room. Can they cut? That's all we care about, right? That's sort of the stereotype. And I could show you lots of images of surgeons, but most of them from contemporary television would not suggest their skills as a surgeon, so we won't go into that. <laughs> um, but let me just then say, with that by way of background, there are a lot of stereotypes when it comes to ethics as well. So I think everybody's familiar with medical ethics. It's been around for a long time. People have written about it, lots of courses about it, lots and lots of books about it. The McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, one of the earliest centers for uh, medical ethics. Well, um, I would suggest that uh, surgical ethics is something that's uh, related and important but that there are some somewhat specific differences. Now, a number of years ago, when I first started talking to people about surgical ethics, a number of people said, well, that's fascinating. It's kind of like, it's an oxymoron. You know, people said, when you say surgical ethics, I think jumbo shrimp, right? <laughs> or, or military intelligence, right? So, so it's, so, so it is um, one of those things that I would say has taken a little bit of time for people to kind of accept. Um, and again, some of the stereotypes may have something to do with that. You know, the, the joke, uh, lots of great jokes, but one of the, the jokes about, you know, what's the difference between God and a surgeon, right? God knows he's not a surgeon, okay? <laughs> um, or, or that surgeons are often wrong but never in doubt, okay? That's also true. And any of you who may be related to surgeons, you know, perhaps you can relate. My father's a surgeon. I understand this. Um, and in fact, when I was graduating from medical school, uh, I had gotten a PhD in philosophy, and I was you know, interested, and went to my dean of students to get the dean's letter. And uh, when he said, gosh, after doing all this work, what have you decided to go into? And I said, surgery. He actually burst out laughing and said, how could you waste all of this you know, on a mindless technical discipline like surgery? Now, I'm going to make the argument today in a little bit, you know, I can't really make it in full-fledged terms, but I'll just suggest to you that um, there is something that is important and distinctive about surgical ethics that are different from other areas in medicine. 
And that attention to those issues is actually critically important to how people learn to be surgeons and also critical to the outcomes of patients. Uh, so the three distinctive features of surgical ethics that I want to address um, and just very briefly are uh, informed consent and how the surgeon-patient relationship relates to those, the nature of responsibility in surgery and how that's different, and then finally, surgical innovation and why, again, that is different um, and distinctive. And so when it comes to informed consent for surgery, again, I would just ask you to think about the relationship between the doctor and a patient when, for example, a patient has had a longstanding relationship with their physician. That may be a relationship that's gone on for years. They know each other, they have common values and whatnot. It's very different when I meet a patient who comes to see me in the office for an operation. I may have 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, but it's a relatively limited period of time in which I have to make sure that they understand what the operation is, what the risk benefits and alternatives are, and I have to make sure that they have at least a level of trust in me that they're willing to lie down on the table and let me usually slit their throat. And so, <laughs> so, so I would suggest that, that is, that's a level of trust that is different than in some other areas of medicine and that the, um, the consent process, because of the absolute vulnerability of the patient during much of the time that I'm with them, uh, it requires further, treat, uh, further attention. Second thing I just want to touch on is I think a distinctive feature is responsibility. So it is true that as physicians, we are responsible for how our patients do. There are some, many things we can't control. But it is also the case that surgeons, I would argue, really feel a sense of personal responsibility much more so than other physicians. And so partly that's because what we do in the operating room has so much of a direct correlation to how the patient does afterwards. And in fact, um, this is uh, the cover of a book uh, called Forgive and Remember by Charles Bosk. So Bosk was a sociology graduate student here at the University of Chicago, and he studied how surgeons are trained at, he actually, his field work was done here uh, at, at the University of Chicago. And he pointed out, and I think perhaps better than anyone else, that the actions of a surgeon are tied to the outcomes of a patient perhaps more closely than any other area of medicine. And that creates the sense of responsibility that I think is distinctive. Now, one of the things that you may not be familiar with is the surgical M&M conference. So M&M is mor morbidity and mortality, right? So this is deaths and complications. So every single surgery department in America has an M&M conference. It's a requirement. Now, the M&M conference, and, and I don't know if any of you seen this show, Monday mornings. I have not seen the show, and I have no idea if it's realistic, but it, my residents who have seen it said, it's not. <laughs> okay, so, so anything you may have learned from that show, just disregard it, okay? Just for the moment. I mean, it may be a great show. I don't know. But just disregard it for a moment. The, the whole idea of the M&M conference is to talk about what happened, okay? And the whole idea of that is to figure out what can we do differently. And so someone will present a case, there will be a discussion, and the final conclusion is always, what could we have done differently, okay? Now, what is fascinating, I think, and, and best stated by Bosk, when the patient of an internist dies, his colleagues ask, what happened? When the patient of a surgeon dies, colleagues ask, what did you do wrong? And I think that's a really telling thing. Now again, very quickly, just to move on, innovation is something that is ubiquitous in medicine. It's great for marketing. Everybody's in favor of it, right? It's, the, it's that great ideas, okay? Innovation, it's wonderful, right? If you look at any advertisement for any medical center, 
we're at the forefront of innovation, right? It's good, this is all good, okay? What's fascinating though, and I think people don't often realize it, is that in surgery, there is nothing like the Food and Drug Administration. There's no FDA for a new operation, okay? So surgeons are expected to see what is it, what's in front of them in the operating room and deal with the problems that they have, address them, be creative, be innovative. Um, and as a result, there is a tendency for people to do things that maybe aren't very well tried out. People, ha there's not often a lot of evidence for it. And this is often good. It's led to tremendous advances. Unfortunately, there are also lots of examples of innovations that haven't worked out well for patients. A few uh, I'll just mention. This is a book about transplanting goat testicles into humans, right? If you're wondering why I haven't heard about this, right? It doesn't work, okay? So, but, but it was all the rage for a while, okay? Uh, another one less well-known, gallstone lithotripsy. When I was a surgical resident, some of my colleagues spent two years in the lab studying gallstone lithotripsy, okay? You don't hear about it anymore because somebody came up with this idea of laparoscopic cholecystectomy and suddenly nobody cares about gallstone lithotripsy. Okay, so something, it wasn't necessarily harmful, but it didn't work out. And then the last one I would argue for you, is, uh, or, or would suggest to you is um, prefrontal lobotomy, was used to treat lots of things. And in case you think this is some fringe idea, okay, the people won the Nobel Prize for this, okay? So these are just a few examples. The reason that I have put this together, surgical ethics and the future of surgery, is that I believe that we need to understand these things. We need to understand the dynamics much more so because in, a, in an era of increasing budgetary constraints, we have to know when should we jump on the bandwagon for something new and when should we say, no, no, not a good idea. And if you look at something like laparoscopic cholecystectomy, okay, taking out a gallbladder with little you know, instruments and, and not making a big incision, if you had made a decision about that operation based on risks, time spent in the operating room, recovery, all of those things, if you had done it in an evidence-based fashion, we would not do any laparoscopic surgery now. Right? So knowing when to jump on the bandwagon is, is hard to know. And, and finally, I would just you know, end by saying, it, really, it's, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you. I, I just shared a few thoughts with you. This is kind of a unique place. and. Uh, for me as a surgeon to be able to collaborate with other people who have an interest in ethics and proceed along the lines of exploring these things I think is something that's really a privilege for me and uh, glad I had a chance to share it with you. So thank you very much. Thank you.